Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another New South Wales Libraries event. We have people here from over 60 New South Wales libraries, and I'm happy to see so many people are here. My name's Melanie, and I'm the Programs Coordinator at Hornsby Library in the north of Sydney. I acknowledge that wherever we are in Australia, we stand on the traditional lands of Aboriginal people. I recognise the traditional custodians of these lands and the continuing connection to land, culture, community and story. And I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Here at Hornsby, we're on the lands of the Darug and Gurungai peoples, and I invite you to recognise the custodians of the country you are on. Many of us came to know Craig Rewcastle as an environmental activist via his ABC series, War on Waste. He's followed this up with a new series and accompanying book, Fight for Planet A, both of which focus on the issue of climate change. I'm sure many of you have got questions for Craig, so please type them into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen, because I'd like to get as, to as many of them as possible. If you include your name and your local library so we all know where you're from, I'd really appreciate that. Now, we're not going to waste time tonight discussing the validity of science or debating the need to take urgent and immediate action. The vast majority of Australians are already convinced of this. The reason that we're not getting the action that we need is not because of a lack of science, it's because of politics. So let's talk about what we can do as individuals. To tell us all about it, please welcome Craig Rewcastle. Hi, Craig. Hello, Melanie. Good to be here. Thank you so much. So, Craig, as I mentioned in the introduction, this book is about what we can all do at a local level rather than just focusing on the need for change from government and big business. So can we actually make meaningful changes individuals? Yeah, well, firstly, I would say it's not just about what we can do. As a matter of fact, probably even more than the TV show, there's a, a few more rants at government and business. Uh, there's, the, there's the occasional going back over history and kind of just losing my mind slowly about um, some of the missed opportunities and that. So, you know, it's definitely not just about what we can do. As a matter of fact, this kind of tends to be split up into what government and others can do and then what we can do ourselves. But it is the case that we can do quite a lot. And it's, uh, it, it's quite interesting because we did a genuine experiment on the documentary with families to see what we could do. And we didn't know what the results were going to be. And I was amazed at how much families were able to reduce their carbon footprint. And if you kind of, if you look at it, Australia's got like 10 million households. If half of those households reduced it by one tonne, which is very, very achievable. I mean, there's a lot of steps in the book that will easily reduce a tonne of your carbon emissions a year. That would cut 5 million tonnes, which is more than we've cut most years as Australia overall anyway. So we actually do have a lot of power in this. And one of the kind of, main areas where Australia's kind of got ahead because government policies will be behind is by people buying solar power. And that's mainly on small house roofs. It's not like overseas, it's mainly kind of big corporate kind of, you know, massive solar farms and that kind of thing. In Australia, it's actually been led by households and small businesses. So yeah, we can make a difference. Yeah, it's something that I found really exciting and you know, gave that sense of hope throughout the book is, yeah, I think you give a lot of things that people can do at all different levels, depending on, you know, on their different situations. Now, yeah. Craig, an argument sometimes gets made that Australia's carbon emissions are relatively insignificant on the global level, but you've compared our carbon footprint to wearing clown shoes. Can you tell us a little bit about why that is? Yeah, no, our footprint, we've we got a huge carbon footprint. And we've got one of the biggest per person in the world. Now, some people try to argue. Now, government tends to try and argue, oh, we shouldn't be looking at this per person. And I think that's a very unfair way to look at it because it's like saying this. So, for instance, uh, per person, our carbon footprint is about double China's. Now, imagine if we had a food shortage in the world and we went around and said, look, you know, the people who are eating twice as much as other people went around and said, look, Chinese people... We, you're the reason you should cut back your diet. You should eat less food because there's a food shortage in the world. And you go, but you, you're eating twice as much food as us. You go, yeah, but we're a small country. It doesn't really matter about us. You know, overall, we're not eating much food. I think it's a really unfair analogy to do. And actually, one of the, uh, one of the bits of fun I have in the book is, is kind of like a draft letter to the government where you can use the same argument to kind of write to them about why you're not paying tax this year because it just doesn't add up to anything, you know. Such a small amount. What could you possibly do with my 0.000004%? To use the, the, the logic that our government uses, it just doesn't work. It falls over. And unfortunately, it's become kind of a very popular argument. 
Maybe we should all try that letter, Craig, and see how um, far it gets us. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking it would be very funny if people did send the letter in. I've decided not to pay tax this year. I looked at my tax and I'm like, 84,000, which is the average wage, I only pay 19,000. What can you do with that? <laughs> you know, this is it. The, the, the logic just doesn't add up. Um, you know, we, we are, we're a big polluter. And <clears throat> again, the great thing is, the very lucky thing, I think, from the Australian perspective is that we can benefit from the other side. I mean, obviously, the reason we have been a polluter is because we've got an enormous amount of resources in like coal and oil and gas and that kind of thing. <clears throat> but we also have an enormous amount of resources in renewable energy. So, Luckily, we're a country that can succeed in both worlds. We just need to make that transition as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Now, one of the resources that you made in the book is a hierarchy for us to consider <coughs> when we work to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's yes. Just, well, you know, I've made a craft project for us. I'm impressed. <laughs> but can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, well, what I did is I kind of took, because it was always useful in war and waste to have the kind of waste hierarchy, mm. you know, landfill is last, recycling is kind of third, but, you know, avoiding and reducing is first. And for, so I was trying to think, what do you do for carbon emissions? And so, yeah, avoid is the first one. If you can avoid creating in the first place. The second one for me was, and this was a really hard, I went back and forth a lot of time, was whether to go renew, as in you go renewable energy, or whether to go re reducing things. Now, reducing is easier in the sense you don't pay anything. Generally speaking, it's just changing your habits. But one of the things I learned from the war on waste experience is that we can often change our habits and then go back. So, you know, you kind of go, oh, I've taken a reusable coffee cup. And I know a lot of people that did this. And then, you know, two months later, it's, ah, oh, forget it. If you do get renewable energy in some way, it's set and forget. It's done. And even if you're not using it, somebody else is. It's kind of, I think, the most important thing. Now, obviously, it depends. Every single person has different things they can do. That's... It's the thing that amazed me most about, most about doing the show is that every family approached it differently, found different solutions. For some of them, their, you know, electricity wasn't their biggest part of their footprint. Other things were. So, you know, you really have to look at your own. And that's what basically the book is kind of breaks down lots of different things you can do. And, you know, I think choose one or two. Don't try and do them all at once. Fair enough. Um, so... In the book, you do, like you say, like you do show us that really some fairly simple behavioural changes can make a significant difference. And that, of course, as you're saying, then collectively it makes a real impact. And I think that there can be that sense that if you can't afford to put solar on or, you know, to buy a Tesla or whatever, that you can't do it. But I think what you've shown again and again is, in fact, you can make, you know, inexpensive or even, you know, free behavioural changes that make oh. significant differences. Absolutely. You can change your behaviour. Like, <clears throat> first thing I would say is that generally speaking, I would generally say that wealthier people have a bigger carbon footprint, they tend to travel more, they tend to have more goods and services, all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so I would, I'm saying I'm putting slightly more pressure on them to go, look, mm -hmm. you know, if you're flying to Europe twice a year and you haven't bothered to get solar panels on your roof, maybe you should reprioritise a little bit, you know. But it is, there's so many behavioural things you can do to change your, you know, to change your footprint. Simple changes. And that's why we, it's interesting looking at food because we're really, um, when we were tossing up whether or not to look at food, there's a lot of people that say, do not mention food. People hate it if you tell them to change their, their diet. And I'm not a vegetarian. I, I'm trying to reduce it as much as possible. But so I thought, look, let's not, we're not going to judge people. We're just going to put down all the facts and they can make the choices themselves. You know, some meats are actually far better for the climate than other meats. So, you know, if somebody is going, I'm never going to give up my meats, at least you can kind of say, to them, well, changing this will be able to still have a big impact. So, you know, I think in the end, it's a bit of a, a choose your own adventure, really, as to what you can do, what works for you, what's achievable. I certainly felt throughout the book and, of course, in the series as well, that you really got the balance right between giving people information but not enforcing too strongly on people what you thought they should do. But I know for me I was perhaps most surprised by some of the 
the changes that making, you know, making simple changes to diet could do. And, you know, like you say, like, I think we all know that a plant-based diet is the best thing. But again, I was really surprised by the different types of animal proteins and the massive difference in them. And of course, one of the things you talk about with, um, with cows and sheep is not only the amount of methane they produce that is problematic, but in fact, the amount of land clearing that is taking place in order to, to feed them. Um, and that, that just makes the problem even bigger. Yeah, and that was a real surprise, actually, when we looked at the documentary, like that a very large amount of our land clearing is for grazing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and again, we've got enormous amounts of land already cleared. If you could kind of limit the grazing to those spots, and there are some moves forward, like I'm not attacking people that eat meat. There are some really interesting moves forward <clears throat> in terms of solutions for, you know, carbon neutral beef and reducing the footprints of farms. As a matter of fact, farming is one of those interesting areas because... It has a big impact, but it also means it's one of the areas that can have a massive impact in the other way as well, in actual fact, in terms of <coughs> improving where we sit. So I don't think it's the enemy in any, any way, shape or form. I think we've just got to try and find those solutions. And again, the difficult thing, I, you know, kind of, I am frustrated in the book at times because you kind of go, look, you know, I talk to the pork manufacturers and they say, oh, we've got all these pork farms that are, you know, turning all their waste into energy and it's reducing the emissions of the, the, the pigs by a lot. And you go, okay, is there anything on a label when I go to a shop so I can support those? Like, no, no, nothing like that. So it's just kind of going, you need to have that interaction between the consumer, the member of the public and the actual companies and the business and that so that we can actually reward those that are doing the right thing. At the moment, there's not much of that. So you do feel a bit useless at times. And I think well, that's one of the areas that I kind of rant a bit about is that, it's really hard when you're just buying things, like buying things and you kind of go, well, what's the carbon footprint of this? There's very little actually, you know, information about that out there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's hard to do. It makes it difficult, doesn't it? One of the examples you give in the book that I really liked was the example of getting rid of single-use plastic shopping bags at supermarkets that, you know, it was a thing that people really lobbied for for a long time, but ultimately the change came because it was demanded by consumers. And I imagine that this is going to have to be the case with a lot of, um, a lot of things about reducing carbon footprint as well. Yeah, no, it was really interesting with that. And it's a classic <clears throat> example, again, of where... A very small change at a, at a family level. You go, oh, I take my reusable bag. And it's funny, I was actually just yesterday at the shop, so I was watching all the people coming in with their own bags going, just a simple habit change has happened there. But the supermarket said, <coughs> we won't do the change unless the government tells us to. But then a few months later, there was a lot of pressure from their consumers, and that's why it actually changed in the end. And that's had a massive, that's led to an 80% reduction in single-use plastic bags. And similarly, if we can get that same kind of pressure on businesses to say, look, what are you actually doing about climate? And you're starting to see it now. I mean, I actually think businesses are in some ways a lot ahead of, particularly the federal government. You're seeing a lot of businesses saying we're going to be totally renewable energy by 2025. You see some banks already doing that. You see, you know, that's kind of happening now. I, I do get the sense that there's a, a bit of a tipping point where people are saying, oh, okay, we really need to finally do something here because... We've left it very late. Yeah, it's it's potentially really exciting. So I hope that it's something that develops a lot more really quickly. Yeah. So there's often this narrative that goes along the lines of if you advocate for a reduction in the use of fossil fuels, you're just part of, you know, some inner city elite who doesn't care about the economic impact this would have on the quiet Australians. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that shows that investing in and transitioning towards renewable energy can have huge and positive economic impacts. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, look, let's firstly say that it's obviously terrible if you're facing a job loss, and we've seen that this year, particularly in COVID, we've seen a lot of people <clears> doing that. Um, no one's asking for the people who are coal miners, for instance, to, to carry the can on this one. It's not their fault. They've done nothing irresponsible. They did nothing wrong. I chatted to some great people who worked in the Hazelwood Gum <coughs> coal-fired power station. And they were amazing talking about, you know, they were 100%. They had solar panels. They were into renewable energy. They knew there was a problem with it, but it was their job. And you, we shouldn't be judging those people about it. So there has to be that transition put there. 
the problem is you see that if we don't do the transition now, what's more likely to happen is that people get stuck without the training to actually make the transition. So, you know, we've got to help those particular parts of the community. But one of the things I find really <clears throat> amazing is where people say it's an inner city issue. Through Five for Planet A and also big weather, I spent a lot of time in regional areas. I mean, I grew up out of Sydney as well. And they're the areas that are really being hit. The rural areas carry the effects of climate change far more than the cities do. Absolutely so much more. So in terms of the people who should be saying, we need to find some solutions and do it now, you would think that voice would be coming from the rural communities. And, I, and it is starting to. I think that there's, I think, as I said, once farmers realise that they're kind of more part of the solution than the problem, I think that will help as well. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you about some comments that Liberal MP Craig Kelly recently made, where he mm. says that we should have tax on electric vehicles so that, and I'm, I'm basically quoting him here, he says, so someone who drives a ute in Western Sydney isn't subsidising somebody driving a $100,000 Tesla around the inner city suburbs of Sydney. So again, we're coming back to this, you know, apparently only inner city lefties care about yeah. climate change. But again, has that been your experience? Look, the reality is this. I mean, if you are somebody who, who does a massive commute in the Western Sydney, if you are somebody who's a tradie in the Western Sydney, Western Sydney or anywhere around Australia who's doing lots of kilometres a day, you would benefit far more from a transition to an electric car than somebody who lives in the inner city and drives 10 k's a day. You're paying an enormous amount for fuel and we have a really inefficient fuel here in Australia. It's very low standards. So you're paying enormous amounts. If you can transition to an electric car, it's going to be much cheaper for you. Now, the reality is in most countries around the world, there are subsidies there that help that, that help that transition. Now, that's just if, while we're first making that transition. Obviously, electric cars will be taxed in the same way as cars are now once the transition's happened. But everything has a transitionary cost. Then there's enormous amounts of subsidies of other parts of cars as well. So it's not about subsidising. The reality is that I don't want to just see rich people in, in a city with Teslas. <clears throat> I want to see everybody be able to get a cheaper car that's also much better for the environment. <clears throat> and Tim, there was a bit of a debate about it also with South Australia last week, talking about bringing in a new tax for electric cars. And they're talking about it as people who use roads, right? You know, you use the road. Think about it, us all, not as people who use roads, people that breathe our air and live in our world. And the real question is that what we should be taxing is the people that are damaging that the most. Now, the benefit, I can't have an electric car. I don't have all street parking. There's not enough infrastructure yet. You go, I love the idea of somebody else having an electric car because it actually benefits me as well. It takes pollution out of the air. It takes not just greenhouse gases, but other pollution out of the air as well. So everyone benefits from it. And that's why we should be encouraging it. And look, the sad thing is, I mean, what Britain said this week, I think they reduced it. They're going to get rid of all petrol and diesel cars by 2030. If we don't move soon, the problem is that every bit of rubbish is going to be dumped on Australia. We're going to find ourselves so far behind. And, you know, it's, it's a, we're already a long way behind. So, look, the people that actually miss out, there's actually a study in the book that looks at this. I think it's we literally, because of our incredibly low fuel standards, we don't even get the most efficient cars in Australia, even just for petrol and diesel. We also basically have such rubbish petrol that we pay hundreds of dollars more a year just because the petrol is so low standard in Australia. So you're already paying for it. We're already doing that paying for it. You know, we should be moving to something where we're not paying as much. Yeah, I found the the narrative that um, that people in the western suburbs or in the bush or whatever, the idea that they don't care about this um, actually super offensive. Um, again, if we're showing that 85% of people are saying they're on board with climate change, surely some of those people are living in those in those areas and really are being misrepresented. Look, this the sad thing in Australia, <clears throat> and I go into this a little bit, is that just Sadly, the Australian debate about climate change became polarised. It became a kind of left-right issue. It was turned into an electoral issue. Now, that's not the case in most countries around the world. Conservative governments lead climate changes around the world, like Germany and England, all that kind of stuff. There's so many places that have done the transition under conservative governments. And it's interesting to start seeing now at the moment we've got state governments like Matt Keane in New South Wales and... Uh, you know, the South Australian Liberal government that are actually really progressive on climate change issues and renewable energy. It's because it's not a left-right issue. 
As a matter of fact, the bizarre thing is I don't even think it's an environmental issue. Like the reality is climate change, you cannot care about the environment at all. You can hate trees and koalas and all that kind of shit and still care about climate change because it's a humanity issue. It's about how we as a humanity, humans will live in this world. So, yeah, look, it obviously has impact on the environment. I'm not saying it's not environmental, but I'm saying it's well and truly beyond that. It's not left-right issue. It's a we need to you know, say where we're going issue. So I think we are starting to see a change in that. It's, and it's just really the kind of federal governments uh, a, bit, a bit behind on that front. Um, councils and state governments are doing a lot better. Yeah, you use in the book the really, um, I guess, good comparison of how different governments in different countries have responded to the coronavirus pandemic. And as you say, because it's not really, it really shouldn't be a political issue. It's about saving people's lives and and so on. And, um, you know, the huge differences we've seen by um, the quality of government in the yeah. way it's been responded to. Yeah, this is it. I mean, you know, look, Australia has been fantastic during coronavirus and because to their full credit, the government's kind of predominantly said, let's listen to the experts. We'll just facilitate what the experts say. And unfortunately, when it comes to climate, we tend to do the opposite. We tend to ignore, cajole, insult the experts. And unfortunately, that means we're behind the, the ball again on that front. And we, we're all losing out because of that, unfortunately. So look, hopefully we've learned some lessons from COVID. And one of the things I think is really concerning though and you, we've got to be really careful of with the COVID thing is that because emissions have gone down during COVID in some areas because we've been locked down not doing as much I think in some people's heads they're linking and saying well oh so climate change is all about solving climate change is about being locked down and not doing things it's not the case at all right now we have so much technology where we can be still living really active lives we can still be traveling and going around and driving and yet be doing it in a way that doesn't not only not hurt the atmosphere but also seems clearer skies and things like that so you know it really is it's not about not doing things don't think that the way to solve this is about lockdown it's actually the other reason that i think i put renewable above reduce is because i don't want people to think that oh, i'm going to be told not to do something here no you're not going to be told to not do something as a matter of fact in australia if we just had some, a bit of leadership from our government and 100% renewable energy, you can go bloody nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you can run 20 widescreen TVs in your body. <laughs> I'm sure that's leaving the dream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no, not to say that doesn't have impact, but I'm just saying that, you know, it isn't, it's, I like, I think that people who don't want to see change have painted this as a, oh, trying to stop you do something. And that's unfortunately not, that's not the case. And I talk about in the book, it's kind of, We've moved from climate denial, which is a very yeah. small proportion, to kind of climate delayers. People that say, oh, no, I totally understand that climate change is a big thing. we just got to move it slower. And I'm really not wanting to, oh, just slow down. That's really, it's kind of a, it's a harder argument to argue against, and that's what we need to be cautious of. Yeah, you compare it to sort of, you know, saying that I plan to lose 20 kilos by Christmas and, you know, I'm going to get on board and I'm going to do it. But yes, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the nice. Australian, the Australian government's, um, yeah, yeah, their claim that we're going to hit the Paris Agreement by 2030 is much, much like my claim that I'm going to lose 20 kilograms by Christmas. You can't disprove it at this point, <laughs> even though there's really every expert and based on everything that I'm actually doing, you're saying it seems to be going the other way, particularly in COVID. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, that's unfortunately the problem. That's why, I mean, I don't get caught up in the kind of Paris Agreement stuff in this book because no. kind of, you can't disprove the future, even though everything is saying, look, we're not going to get there. And, you know, it's funny that like the, the roadmap to get there involves like technological change. Like I'll lose 20 kilos by Christmas if technology comes along, you know. <laughs> That's where we are, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> um, one of the things that I noticed in the TV series is that politicians and business people tend to quite literally run away when you approach them. <laughs> I thought well, that only that... some. Come on, some of them. Like <laughs> Some of them, yeah, with more sort of passion than others, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but it's a pretty good metaphor for how they're dealing with climate change in general, I thought. Um, yeah. What do you think it's going to take to get them to actually engage with the issue more seriously? It's a tough one. I think that unfortunately, yeah. I mean, firstly, let me just say that 
when I went to Scott Morrison with the kind of <clears throat> balloons, I genuinely thought he would engage. I actually thought it would be quite a boring interview, to be honest. I thought he would engage. He would give the kind of standard lines that would be given. You know, I wasn't trying to chase him away. I was trying to actually have a conversation with him about it. So I was surprised that he ran away on the day. Um, I th unfortunately, in Australian politics, there's a bit of a, you know, once bitten, twice shy at the moment in that we've had so many kind of prime ministers or energy ministers fall over because of engaging bits. And also, I think there's a bit of a misconception about the last election. Because going into it, people were like, this is the climate election. And then, it, then you know, the Liberal Party won, who was obviously on the, the less climate side of that debate. Um, people took it as a rebuffing of climate issues. Now, if you actually look at it at a kind of more seat-based level, that's not really the case. There were actually some large swings that probably are attributable to climate issues, really. And there were so many other issues. Remember, there's all the kind of franking credits and this, that, and the next thing, and death taxes and all this kind of stuff. So elections are really hard to judge what the issue is. And this is actually another thing that goes back to the, I think this is a really good analogy to, to this goes back to that point we were talking about earlier about can you make a difference, right? So just say that 49% of us in Australia care passionately about climate change and vote a particular way and lose the election. And it doesn't <clears throat> go to a party that's going to do more about climate change. 49%. It's kind of winner takes all in politics. If 49% of Australians were active on climate action, not just in protesting, but also in doing stuff, that has an enormous impact. That's a huge thing. So I think we, we have to, you know, we have to be fighting at a political level as well. But I think we have to realise that we can make changes otherwise. And the other thing about that is that when you start trying to make changes, you kind of realise where the government's letting you down. You should like, I'd really love to do this. Oh, I can't do that. Why is that? Oh, the government's doing bugger all about it. Yeah. So it helps um, to figure it out. Craig, do you think that the results of the US election are going to have any impact on our climate change policy here at home? Look, I think it's going to put a lot more pressure on the Australian government than if it had gone the other way. Um, I presume we're saying Biden won, right? I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to keep up with the tweets. <laughs> I think so. Look, let's just go with that narrative for the moment. Um, despite the very passionate tweets to the contrary. Um, I think it is going to put more pressure. And, you know, America is a big country that leads in that area. And the fact they pulled out of the Paris Agreement was obviously not positive. So, yeah, I, I think it will actually have more impact. But it'll put more pressure on Australia. How much has changed? Look, I think I do think things are changing. I actually think that it's interesting. I think the economics of a lot of its underlying has changed. So I actually think that, to be honest, there's a bit more talk about, I think, gas fueled economy, you know, ga gas fueled recovery is being used a bit more as a kind of political rhetoric tool than the reality underlying it, because they're not really succeeding on a lot of those levels because the economics don't make, you know, add up anymore. So that's making the change a bit easier. But yeah, we're, we're real laggards in Australia and hopefully, you know, this is the thing I, I, I always found amazing when you looked into it and went, oh, we have a We've got a larger footprint than Americans per person. Seriously, like to drive to the supermarket, they take the monster truck, and yet we still have a larger footprint. It's just crazy. Um, but you say, like, one of the things I thought was really interesting is you talk about the carbon footprint of New Yorkers, for instance, which is significantly lower than ours, <clears throat> and not, you know, necessarily what you would anticipate when you start looking into it. Yeah, and again, that's because I'm not, you know, it's unfair to compare Australia to New York. But what I'm kind of showing is that because it's a compact city and there's great public transport, it's actually a really small carbon footprint as a city. And that's one of the things we need to do. And there's, there's been some really good investment in public transport recently. And even actually, literally even, I mean, this book's fairly up to date. It kind of went to the printers like a month or so ago. So it's pretty up to date. But even since then, We've seen a lot of announcements from governments saying we're going to go to electric buses and we're going to go to renewable buses, energy and that kind of thing. So, you know, there's some really good stuff happening at the moment. But, you know, we've got to increase public transport. And one of the things I find, like, one of the things I find hard is, for instance, cycling. I love cycling, right? I actually put that in the chapter about what government can do, what, not what you can do, because I think the reality is that councils and state governments and that need to build bike lanes in that to attract people to them 
there's so many people who want to do it, but kind of go, I'm not riding in the middle of traffic and kind of, you know, having buses honking at me and all that kind of thing. And I, and I totally understand that. So I kind of think it's that, it would be one of those examples where you go, I can do a certain amount, but I can do a lot more if I get the assistance of government. And the best examples are when population and the government are working together, really. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to stop for a minute to acknowledge the great work that's being done at a local government level. Um, I know that my council's got a, it's an awesome community recycling centre where you can take almost anything that you can think of to be safely recycled. Um, my council's just set a target of um, net zero emissions, which is great. Um, what are some of the initiatives that you've seen that you feel excited about? Yeah, look, it's great. I mean, a lot of councils are net zero by the 2050 or saying 2030 even. A lot of them are working on um, basically having all of their energy renewable by 2025, for instance. One of the things that I, I really always constantly say to councils when I talk to them is saying, look, don't just focus on your own footprint. It's what's great is if you can also help your community members, if you can kind of go, look, you know, because I, I, so many people we bump into or I bump into kind of are like, oh, I've always wanted to get solar, but I... I looked into it for a while and it became really complex and, you know, there was all these dodgy people operating or whatever. And you can go, that's where if you've got, you know, the council can help people out and say, here's somebody who we really suggest is great. Or these people in an area have our kind of ticket of approval, or, you know, these are some people you can talk to Then that helps people like that. And also there's some great councils in um, around Australia. There was one Darabin council in Victoria who the council are kind of helping people in low income houses get solar and then just taking it out of their rates. And it's always it's always less than the savings they're getting. And I love that so much because one of the things I'm always concerned about is people that don't have the money getting left behind. So if councils can be kind of going, we're going to bring along those who don't have the money and help them out. And we all benefit again because renewable energy means we have less pollution. So yeah, look, councils can do a lot. And, and it really is, I think it's, um, I think that there are times in the climate debate in Australia, you can get quite depressed. But I think there's so many positive examples of councils, businesses, governments, individuals doing things now that you're going to go, you can at least balance up your depression with a bit of enthusiasm at times. Absolutely. We um, here in Hornsby in the library, we work really closely with our waste education team on running all sorts of community education events. And it's, you know, I've, it's really exciting. We have huge uptake and interest in them. And I guess I would encourage everybody at home that if you're not sure, what your local government is doing in the area to check it out because you'll probably be surprised by how much they are doing. Yeah. So, you know, again, like with all levels of government, if it's something that's important to you, it's really important that you communicate that to your elected representative exactly. so that they know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it is, in the book, I talk about how much recycling actually reduces, again, carbon footprint as well as everything else. It's like, it's a real positive. So we Absolutely. Um, in the series, um, we saw that people responded really strongly to the visual cues you created. So, you know, there were the balloons for carbon emissions and the umbrellas for deforestation and melting ice. Um, and, you know, people were moved to tears by them. Which one of those resonated with you the most? Yeah, look, the, I mean, I think Probably the, the the umbrellas, just seeing the extent to which we're kind of land clearing in Australia really shocked me. And just to say there have been some positive changes in the laws in Queensland since, so hopefully we'll see that going down, although unfortunately we've gone backwards in New South Wales. But I think that's really shocking. And this is the thing, this is the thing I found really hard is after war and waste where, you know, we all engage really easily with waste because we kind of see it. It's there in our kitchen, it's the litter we see there, we see it in the ocean climate change is so much harder and trying to actually visualize that problem is one of the, the reasons that we fall behind. I think it's hard to kind of make those steps about what is it that leads to this problem? Um, so yeah, it really is. Yeah. Visualizing is quite important, but it's, it's hard. That's why, that's why climate change is a harder issue to deal with than waste, for instance, or to get people to engage with because it's not as visual. It's not as easy to see. That's right in the um, beginning, in the introduction, you talk about it um, being like the sort of most boring and ridiculous Bond villain that you've, you've ever seen, but, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's slowly. It is, it exactly. This is, this is it. Climate change, I call it the perfect enemy. 
because if you want to defeat humanity, just kill them really slowly. We've got an attention span of gnats. We've kind of, interestingly enough, when I first wrote part of the introduction, it was in the early days of coronavirus when we kind of were responding quite quickly. And by later on, you'd seen once people kind of got used to being around, we're like, ah, we lost interest already. And that's amazing to see even in a short time span, us losing interest. And that's why climate change is it. It's the absolute perfect enemy. If you were a Bond villain and you want to kill humanity, use a really slow way of doing it. And you, you'll, you'll definitely win. As I said, it doesn't make a good movie, but, uh, you know, the most successful way. Um, one of the things, you've already touched on this, but I just wanted to mention one of the websites you refer to in the book. So, you know, you've said that people can find solar overwhelming, they're not sure what rebates are available or they maybe think they're not available anymore and then, you know, there's so much information out there that it can get overwhelming. And you recommend the Clean Energy Council website. So we'll pop the, um, the website up in the chat for people somewhere. But are there any other places that you think people should check out? Yeah, look, there's there's there's, a few, there's some good sites out there nowadays. And I, look, I, I would actually say one of the one of the ways the places to start nowadays is to just talk to people around your area. It's very unlikely that you don't have people around your area that now have solar panels. So talk to them about who they used and whether the experience was good. Um, that's probably going to be the best information you get is from that. Talk to your council. There's also there are websites like Solar Quotes and that which actually do take you through users and have reviews of people and that kind of stuff. So, you know, I I tend to find that. There's some very pushy salespeople out there. I tend to go to the people who are quite nerdy and say, no, that won't work. Or, you know, I want to come and look at your roof first rather than just going, yeah, we'll have it there tomorrow. You know, that's yeah. my general approach when you have that. But look, uh, as I said, talk to people in your community. It's very unlikely that you don't have people around you that have that now. So, you know, use their expertise. If they had a good experience, follow that. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to open up to audience questions now. We've got quite a few here, but I would encourage anybody who still has some, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many as we can. So my qu first question for you is from Maxine from Chatswood. Um, she said she'd be really interested to know if anything happened with the man who developed the technology to recycle takeaway coffee cups. Um, she says he did something that got the plastic in a film out and she's yeah. horrified, of course, because of covid there's been a bit of a backward step. I know, there has been. A bit yes. of a, yeah. <laughs> I must have been in COVID. It's the first time I've used a disposable mm. coffee cup. But again, I say, don't take that out of the person that's serving. It's not their fault. <laughs> we just got to roll with that kind of thing and we'll go back the other way. Um, that technology didn't go ahead as much. So the actual people that, that did the kind of collection of coffee cups through 7-Eleven, for instance, were going to use that technology. They used a different technology where... Uh, it was kind of mashed up a lot and put into other products like reusable coffee cups and that kind of thing. So they did find a recycling route for it. It wasn't the specific technology that we looked at in that episode of War on Waste. So, um, yeah, you know, the recycling happened, but in a slightly different way. Um, okay, Craig, we've got Alan from the Blue Mountains. He's saying his family are vegan train commuters waiting on a solar install, so they're doing pretty well. What do you think they should do next apart from protesting outside of Parliament House? Yeah, look, I, I think you're kind of doing all those things, and I think at some point it does get to that. Like, it's not just protesting outside of Parliament House. It's probably talking to more people in your community as well and getting together. I mean, I think that's a really powerful thing. And it's not talking to the people who are the denialists or, you know, who are like the officers have. Don't waste your time on them. Talk to the people in your community who you think are most, less, most likely to kind of come along on the journey with you. So um, vegan commuters with solar panels and Blue Mountains, I mean, such an area that gets hammered by fires and <clears throat> is really threatened by climate change. I was, I was literally there today um, in an area where they're being burnt out. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, this is what can be frustrating. And I understand for those people who have kind of done everything already, like, what can I do more? And I think, you know, we need to change the, just have those conversations. Don't be pushy about it. Tell people how great it is what you're doing, you know, tell people how easy it is what you do because that can get people to change their behavior as well rather than kind of yelling at them. That's the hard challenge. Don't chase and chase them off the beach with, you know, balloons. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Oh, we've got somebody from Brisbane. Hello, interstate viewers. Um, and they've got some questions for you. So they want to know how many decisions 
you personally made, I guess, in the production choices for Fight for Planet A. So they're wondering if you chose to bring the carbon balloons and stand in front of Parliament House or if that was someone else who thought that was a good idea. Uh, the balloons were my idea initially. And just so I say, for all the wasties out there, um, we looked at in so many other alternatives because we obviously didn't want to use balloons because <laughs> balloons have their own footprint. Well, they don't, they don't have a carbon footprint. The, the gas doesn't have a carbon footprint. But we were very concerned about the waste. So what we did is, like, you would not believe how much time went into making. Every balloon was, like, triple tied so that it couldn't, if it popped or if it fell off, it couldn't float away. So we never lost a single balloon in the whole process. And we were very cautious to try and reduce as much, um, you know, gas as we used as well. So look, we did, we, we, we spent a lot of time trying to find a more sustainable approach than balloons. But in the end, it was the only way we could really communicate that. And we thought overall, it was uh, more of a benefit than a, than a disadvantage. But no balloons were lost in the filming of that stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. I was almost there. I was almost going to do a balloon installation to decorate behind me for the event, and I thought, yeah. oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. Generally, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. I mean, we did. We did like we offset the whole production. We also did a lot of kind of in doing the production. Um, we did a lot of things like we car shared a lot and that kind of thing. And one of the funny things is watching Fight for Planet A is it came out during COVID, right? Yes. <clears throat> So to everyone watching, it would just seem really normal that we were doing Skype calls with the families and that. But we actually filmed it before COVID. We did that to reduce our carbon footprint. We did it because we were like, we don't want to always have to fly to catch up with everyone or drive. So we'll do it via computer and that. And then as COVID came and it seemed like the norm. But at the time it was like, no, that was a specific decision made to try and reduce the footprint of the show while we were actually filming it as well. Um, I've got a question from Usha. She's um, talking about, I guess, loss of trees in the suburban environment. So she's saying there's a worrying culture of knockdown rebuild in the housing industry. But of course, every time this happens, the property is denuded of the green canopy. Um, and then these trees take you know, incredibly long time to grow back. Um, what do you think about that can be done down at a planning level to reduce it because it's a huge tragedy? Yeah, no, it is. It's interesting, though. Um, there's a lot of councils and governments starting to realise that trees are incredibly important in a, in a city environment. So shading uh, over footpaths and roads, for instance, massively reduces the heat and the reflective heat in the area. And that's becoming an important thing. Like, I was in Western Sydney today, and it was like 38 degrees outside. So they're realising we have to have a lot more trees. So there is actually a bit of that happening. But you're right, though, that most of our kind of building sites at the moment get rid of all the trees and, you know, are very much denuded. And there's often not much space to actually plant the trees as well. So it is a real problem and it'd be great. And I'm also aware that post, post the kind of fire season we saw, people are saying, well, we need to not have trees right next to the house. And I think that's fine. If if it's a danger issue amongst fire, obviously getting rid of some trees is okay. But overall, we need to have design happening that can have so many more trees. We also need to have design happening that can, you know, actually face... Let me just close this because there's a dog bark. Of course. We also need to... One of the things that astounds me is we have planning so that, for instance, houses are facing to the north. You know, we still build new streets and new developments and kind of go, okay, we're all going to face to east and west and go... It's just building more houses. We need more air conditioning to cool down. We don't seem to be learning those kind of lessons. Absolutely. Now, Craig, I've got somebody who's asking if you can explain the difference between the methane that's produced from cow and sheep burps um, and the gases that are produced from green waste and other sorts of waste. <clears throat> okay. Well, I mean, at its core, we're still talking about methane. Um, and methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas. And it's interesting because one of the one of the interesting moments in doing this show was talking to a professor up in New England who's been looking at this, uh, Roger Hegarty, who's been looking at this for quite a while, you know, solving emissions from cattle and sheep. And generally scientists compare 
carbon dioxide with methane and say methane is 28 times more stronger because they're looking at over 100 years. But methane is only around for 12 years. So in terms of if you look at how long it's actually around, it's like 80 times more powerful. So it really means that those things that are pumping out methane have a much bigger impact straight away, even though long term it's not quite as bad. And that's why if we're trying to reduce our emissions now, it does make sense to focus on things like, you know, cattle and sheep and the methane they're pumping into the atmosphere. Interestingly enough, one of the reasons I did this show is because when I was looking at um, carbon emissions through waste, and obviously a lot of that is through methane coming from landfills, we've already spent a lot of time trying to fix that problem. And that has been reduced quite a lot. So it's like, that's some of the low hanging fruit. There's still a lot we can do. For instance, we've got to get rid of, um, the fact that we still throw away a lot of our food waste and put it into landfill, ridiculous. It's about <clears throat> seven to nine million tonnes of CO2 created by throwing out food waste. What a way, what a simple thing to solve. So hopefully we can solve that pretty quickly. But look, you know, we really need to solve the problem of, you know, we need to be looking at that issue as well, whether it's through, whether the methane is through landfill or cows or sheep. Um, Craig, somebody from Burwood Library is asking, what do you think are some effective methods that scientists can use to communicate concepts with the general public? So strategies to reduce household waste and individual carbon footprint. They should talk to you. Yeah, well, no, no, <laughs> look, it's hard. I actually, I think there's a bit of a thing where like people are like, well, you know, there's been a pushback against climate change so long, it must be the scientist's mistake. It's not the scientist's mistake. A lot of the most people who are communicating on this front know that the science is right. It's it's vested interests that are doing a lot of the pushback, and that's why it needs to be more of a political debate. I mean, the reality is that the arguments that are put out there against climate change tend to be funded by think tanks that are funded by you know oil or gas, or for instance, or coal. So it's not a question of bad communication by science. It's a question of intentionally misleading communication coming from the other side to protect vested interests. And that's why we just got to be alert to it. And I think, um, uh, yeah, I don't blame scientists for this. I don't think it's their lack of communication skills. Although that said, like it is, as I said, it's hard. It is a hard communication thing. And that's why showing people having people understand their own life's link to it can actually help people engage with it a bit more, I think. It's not Craig, um, we've got Beth asking um, if you could please run for Prime Minister. Is that, is that anything that you've got plans to do? No, I, I prefer the Prime Minister running for me than me running for Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> look, uh, no, yeah, probably not. I think it's... Um, I'm not sure I'm cut out for politics. I think I, I even found, like... Doing something like War and Waste, I found it incredibly frustrating even like two years later when all these changes hadn't happened. I think I would find the political process very frustrating. Um, and that's why, look, one of the reasons it's important for us to also do things ourselves is because <clears throat> sometimes it can become pretty depressing when you're waiting for politics and politicians to solve problems. Um, it can be slow and frustrating at times. And that's why they need to, we need to keep the pressure up there, but we need to also look at other solutions as well, because otherwise it can be depressing. Um, Craig, Linda is asking you if you've had a chance to go on country and speak to Indigenous rangers out in the outback um, to get their perspective on what's happening. In terms of like cultural burns, that, yeah, so in, in big weather, the third episode of big weather, we... Uh, we went on country and <clears throat> looked at a cultural burn, which I think is a really interesting uh, approach to hazard reduction in Australia. It's kind of a, it's a cooler burn. It really uses Indigenous knowledge to know when to burn certain areas. It's fascinating to actually watch it in practice. And it, not only is it about hazard reduction, it also, it also protects flora and fauna because it doesn't try to just wipe it all out, which is what some of our more traditional hazard reduction has done. Uh, so, yeah, like we have a lot to learn from the Indigenous community about ways to deal with our environment that they've been dealing with for many years. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's really interesting. So, it's a cultural burns. And there's been a really, uh, <clears throat> there's been a, a lot more kind of engagement between, for instance, rural fire services and Indigenous landowners and Indigenous kind of um, knowledge to actually solve these problems since last fire season so that's great to see 
Um, Craig, we've got a question from Marilla, who's 11, and she's wondering if you've implemented some of the changes that you showed in the fight for Planet A in your own home and which ones you found more challenging. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. As a matter of fact, uh, unlike War and Waste, where probably I was learning a lot on the way, some of Fight for Planet A is just based on things I've been doing over the last few years. Actually, it was interesting, actually. I found that often academic things are all written in this really complex way. We couldn't find academic pieces that kind of looked at it from a perspective of a household. And some of the, some of the actual kind of data we did was just based on stuff I'd been doing myself in my own life. But it's a slow process at times. So energy, I think I was really easy and I've been kind of good on that front. Uh, the one in which I'm not good is still the, my probably food footprint. Uh, much better in terms of waste, like in terms of food waste and that, you know, composting and all that's great. But uh, still, I still do consume meat at times. I've definitely massively reduced my red meat consumption, but uh, that's probably where I'm the worst. And, and uh, transport I find kind of good and bad. Like I've been slowly changing my transport over the years. There are times, uh, times I'm much better at getting on my bike than others. And, and I, I did find it a struggle during Corona actually in terms of public transport as well. So yeah, absolutely trying to, to make those changes and um, some areas really successful, some areas not as good. And that's one of the things I just think really important is that people don't, don't get dispirited if you're not perfect. I actually don't think anyone's perfect on this area. Like, what you should be doing is finding the things that you can change and making those changes and then trying to get better at them. I actually don't, my approach is not to say I'm going to be zero straight away. It's to go, I wonder if I can kind of halve my footprint. And then my next goal will be to halve it again. My next goal will be halve it again. I may never get to zero, but if we all did that, it would have a massive impact. So yeah, look, you know, as I said, everyone can do, everyone can do make changes to have an impact here. Absolutely. Um, Craig, Jen is wondering if you've kept up with the households from the TV series and whether or not they've been able to sustain the changes that they made. Uh, yeah, I, I did get in contact with them recently. And, um, yeah, look, I think with all these things, some of the changes will go back a bit. Like some of the food changes, some of the families, you know, didn't love, particularly with kids. Uh, you know, and this is it. It's about going... They tried some of the, you know, food changes with the kids and they like hated the vegetarian options. And you're like, and I've had young kids, I've got teenagers now, but you know, I understand what it's like. If they're throwing that food back at you, you are going back to your meat bag bowl in two seconds. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, and this is, I guess, why making those longer term changes. So, you know, putting in fans or whatever, or, or using renewable energy or whatever, if you can make those kind of changes that then don't rely on just your habit change and have long-term effects that's really great but yeah no uh look i i don't think anyone will make i don't think every change will stay but i think a lot of the changes will definitely stay um we've got melissa asking what's your opinion on see-through garbage and recycling bins oh is, is that to like shame people about their waves oh yeah this is the see-through one yeah ah oh, man people drive me crazy with their kind of with I, I remember we were doing War and Waste. I went around in the back of a garbage truck in Melbourne and you'd have a recycling bin right next to a, a landfill bin. And it's amazing how many people just like, literally, there's no different effort. It's both there and you see cans. And so like, I, what is it? I think one ton of aluminium recycled saves about nine tons of carbon dioxide. So the difference between putting an aluminium can in a garbage bin or a recycling bin has a huge impact, the difference there. And yet people don't do it. But I've seen those seafood things. And I think I think it's meant to kind of make people see whether they're making the right choices. I still go past them and see the wrong things in the wrong bins. And it slightly, you know, frustrates me. But yeah, I, I, I'm sure there's a study behind it that shows that it makes people do it more effectively. From my experience of looking at it, People aren't still getting it right, but this is it. Yeah, you know. it's still complex. By the way, just that being said, just let me say, even after doing war and waste, I still stand by my recycling bin at times. Going, oh, I don't know what to do with this thing. Like, <clears throat> there are so many complex products, and there's a thing called the Australasian Recycling Label, which is coming out. And you see on some products, which kind of shows you which bin it should go in, and that's a great step forward because it's <clears throat> the actual manufacturer is telling you, okay, this bit is recyclable, this bit isn't, because 
you need a chemical engineering degree to actually figure that out yourself. Um, Craig, we've got Amanda from Blacktown and she's asking for your tips on talking to kids about the reality of climate change. She says she's got a three and a half year old. Um, what do two you- Two and a half year old? A three and a half, so. <laughs> three and a half, okay. I think three and a half is very early to be having the climate chat. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting with kids because I think kids are amazingly engaged on this and have, have a lot of knowledge very early on. I think I know there are some kids who get quite anxious about it. And it's one of the hard things about climate communication is that and particularly we found this hard with the show because we're doing a broadcast to everyone, right? So within that audience are people who are already stressed beyond belief about climate change and absolutely can't believe nothing's happening. And you've got other people who are kind of like, yeah, maybe this is just something, you know, starting to maybe, oh, those fires are bad, you know, just slowly coming on. So, yeah, I think you just got to pick with your kid where they sit there. You know, you don't want to make them too anxious about it. You need them to understand that there are a lot of solutions out there. And I guess talk to them about solutions as well as the problems. That was one thing I'd say because it can be confronting for kids at that point where you they start to go, hang on a second, my future is this. And I, I'm amazed at how many kids kind of you know people in the 20s are saying i'm not having kids because there's a climate change in that so there's a real anxiety out there in the community and and i understand why because we have left a lot of the problems to them but um in terms of talking to your kids i think talk to them about problems but also to talk to them about solutions and um tell them that our generation is going to get their shit together soon okay <laughs> Um, we have got so many questions here and only a few minutes left. So unfortunately, we're not going to get to them all. But I do really want to say thank you to everybody for sending them through. And um, I'll send all of the questions through to Craig because I think he probably will be interested to see what people are wanting to ask. I'd love to see them, yeah. yeah. I'll try yeah, and find so out if I miss anything in the book. <laughs> You'll see <laughs> five of my two books has been put out briefly. It's like, oh, I forgot all these bits. Yeah, so, so d please do that. And even if you have comments rather than questions, because, you know, one of the hard things for writers is getting out and doing their talks on Zoom, which is great, but you don't get to chat to people in the signing queue and you don't get yeah. to have little conversations. So, you know, let Craig know what you think of his book, let yeah. know what page number you've got circled. I didn't get a circle in mine because I got it from the publisher. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah, it was a very crazy idea when I was signing books to also put a smiley face based on which book while I was signing. That <laughs> made for a very long night. <clears throat> I'm going to finish up because there's lots and lots of questions coming through about solar and apartments and people asking, I guess, for some guidance about what you can do if you're living in an apartment, if you want to put solar in. What yeah. yeah, well, look, I mean, there's certain constraints on putting solar in for an apartment. So, look. It's not as ideal, but there is, in actual fact, and I go into this in the book, if you want to have probably the biggest impact you can have is to have 100% renewable energy. And if you put solar on your roof, that might help it out. But there's other ways to do that. And that's through things like green power. If you get green power, it means that 100% of your energy is coming from <coughs> renewable sources. And it's a great system because what it does is if you say to your energy provider, I want to go green power, you will quite pay slightly more. But again, you can offset that by reducing. Um, that energy provider can't just say, oh, I've already got some renewable energy I can use for that. They have to go out and purchase extra renewable energy on top of that. And it's a great way of pushing for more renewable energy in the, in the population. And it's the same thing that, the, for instance, Canberra has done. Everyone says Canberra is great because they have 100% renewable energy now. That's not because they actually necessarily have it in Canberra. It's because they say, okay, we're going to buy 100% renewable energy. So you can do that as an apartment. As I say in the book, you too can be like Canberra. It's a, you know, the sticker, the bumper sticker no one wants. Uh, but it is a way you can actually do that. If you want to be renewable energy, you can actually do it, even if you're in apartments. But also talking to your apartment block about, you know, becoming, uh, buying renewable energy. It's what businesses are doing as well. And, Again, it can feel like a small impact, but if everyone starts doing that, if everyone said, I want renewable energy only, that's going to speed that chain transition. It's going to speed the closing down of coal-fired power stations. It's going to speed the, the transition to renewable energy. And it's interesting, I've been getting renewable energy for, I mean, I've been at 100% green power for years. And interestingly enough, they wrote to me recently saying, oh, the price is going down of that uh, because 
renewable energy is becoming cheaper and cheaper. So, you know, it's one way you can do it. Again, not everyone can do it. I'm not saying if you can't afford to do that, don't do it. You know, no, no pressure on you. But if you are somebody who can afford to do it, it's a fantastic way of actually, you know, speeding that transition. Thank you, Craig. That's unfortunately going to have to be our last question for the night because of time. I want to say thank you so much to everybody for joining us, particularly to Craig. And think of what like a low carbon event this has been. You couldn't have gone to 60 libraries in New South Wales. No, look, <laughs> it's been an interesting lesson through COVID. So thank you, Melanie. And thank you to everyone for joining us as well. I really, uh, you know, love chatting to everyone and, uh, you know, Hope you enjoy the book if you get it. Go, you know, <laughs> even if you just go to the library and read it there, which is a great way to do it. Oh, well, if people borrow it from the library, you still get some money through public lending, right? I'm not fussed about that. I actually <laughs> like the idea of people using library because it's sure, it yeah. has multiple uses. One of the great things about reducing footprint, and we talk, I talk about this, is that if you can use something multiple times and prolong its life, it immediately reduces the footprint, the environmental footprint of something. So borrow away. I don't care about the money side of it. <laughs> Thank you. But I would really encourage people to get out there and check out the book. Like, we've, like there is so much content in there that we really have touched on <laughs> very little of it. Um, and you, there's, it's just such an amazing resource. You should buy it for everybody, you know, for Christmas. It's a great way to get the conversation started. So please do. Just before I let everybody go, I just want to remind you, we'll be sharing the recording of this on the New South Wales Library Events YouTube. So if you've missed anything, you'll be able to pop on over there and check it out. And don't forget, in the next couple of weeks, we've got events coming up with Governor Sir Peter Cosgrove, the former Governor General, and also Mary Lee, who was the, well, who still is the wife of Mao's Last Dance, the author, Lee um, Schwinsing. So it's really exciting to be having all of these authors. Um, but I'm so glad that so many people came out here tonight to see Craig. So, Craig, thank you again, and thank you to everybody at home for watching. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank Bye. you.